All right, so I will call to order the Conway School Committee meeting Wednesday, August 19th at 5.05 p.m. And welcome everybody. Um, the first item on our agenda is to call the order, so we're all set there. Number two, review and approve the minutes of May 20th, 2020. Um, so uh, I got a chance to look at the min minutes. Philip, did you? Uh, they were great. So I, I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, approve the minutes of May 20th. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thanks, Denise. Um, so uh, I guess we'll do a roll call vote for approving in the minutes. Is there any discussion about them that we need to do? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, Philip yes. Walter? Yes. Denise Storm? And Michael Merritt, yes. All right, our next item of business is the financial statement. Uh, and Shelly, that's, I imagine that's you. That's me. <laughs> Um, so I did send this out to school committee and uh, Kristen earlier today. I apologize I didn't get it to you yesterday. It has been a very, very busy time. Um, but I hope you got a chance to take a look in, at, at an, in advance. Um, I do have two dogs, so they might interrupt us, but I'll try to keep them quiet, but I can hear them around the corner. Um, so I'm going to go over the report. Darius, do you want to do screen share like we did in the other meeting or not? It's up to you. Well, once you bring it up, then I got to do it because we're like, what, you're not going to share with us? Um, hang on, it'll take me one second. To, I didn't have it ready to go. All right. Um, so I'll talk about the warrant. So we signed uh, electronically six warrants in July, totaling $19,701.81. Um, Kristen, if you're taking notes, this is in the report, so you don't have to get these numbers exactly. I made a note my, to myself to refer to your report, so I'll go back and do that. Thank you. Great. Uh, and then we have had uh, two batches of warrants signed electronically for FY21. There were three warrants in the first batch totaling um, $18,811.17. And the second batch had four warrants totaling $6,060.56. So thank you, school committee, for reviewing and signing those electronically. So I'm going to go through an FY20 wrap-up of the general fund and all of the revolving accounts as they pertain to Conway Grammar School. And then we'll talk about fiscal year 21 followed and closing with the COVID related grant funding. The last financial update was in May, uh, roughly three months ago. And we had talked at that time about there being $113,000 remaining to be spent in the general fund budget. I had estimated that we would spend about 43,000 of that, leaving roughly 70,000 in the general fund. Uh, at that time, the school committee had agreed to supplement school lunch wages because we knew that school lunch was gonna have no revenue coming in. And we were going to have very, um, I'm sorry, very limited revenue with still wages and food costs needing to be paid. So we did make that transfer. Uh, school committee also agreed to spend $15,000 on the one-to-one -one technology initiative, which would be to get uh, Chromebooks for all students at Conway Grammar School. And then any remaining funds, which were estimated at $40,000 at that point, would be reallocated to school choice. Uh, expenditures were lower than we expected. Darius, you can scroll down a little bit. Uh, oh, not quite. Uh, a little bit more. Higher up. Sorry. All right, there. <laughs> uh, school choice expenses, I'm sorry, not school choice, general fund expenses were less than we anticipated. So we were predicted to spend around 43 and we spent less than 30. And the Chromebooks that we had allocated funds for, for 15,000, 12,500 of that was covered through the Municipal CARES Act grant. We were able to reallocate instead of the $40,000 projection, roughly $87,000 back into school choice for future use, which would help support the level funded budget that we prepared for FY21. So we ended the year in a better position than we anticipated with the general fund. 
which is great news because we will have more funds to support this fiscal year and future years to come. Uh, any questions on general fund before I keep going into the revolving accounts? No, okay. Uh, so the school choice summary um, is where I'm gonna go next, Darius. So school choice revenue was higher than anticipated than our actual enrollments um, from what Jess, Desi projected. So what Desi does is they take your end of year enrollment numbers from the prior year, and that is what they base your revenue on for the next year. So in FY19, uh, our enrollments were less than FY20, so it increased our revenue. They make an adjustment at the end of the year in June. So we ended up with an increase in revenue there. We also had some special education increment claims. Also, our expenses were lower because we reclassified from the general fund and some of our, our uh, salaries and wages were a little bit lower than we anticipated anyway. So we ended up having some extra money going back into school choice. Uh, the increase was $139,000 and we currently have a fund balance of $380,581 going into FY21. So that's also great news for Conway Grammar School. Early childhood, I'm gonna jump to the summary. Uh, revenue decreased due to COVID closure. We knew that we were not gonna have tuition revenue coming in at the same time we continued paying salaries and wages. Um, we knew that that was going to be a choice uh, that we were making and that there would be some hardship to this account. However, wages were lower than we anticipated and budgeted for. So we did see some, while there was a drop in revenue, we saw a, a decrease in expenses as well. The net result is only about a $4,000 gain in this program compared to, um, I'm sorry, a $4,000 loss compared to what we budgeted. So we're looking at ending the year $94,755.62 in the early childhood revolving account. Also a really healthy position for that account to be going into in the new fiscal year, given all of the hardship that we face. Special education revolving, um, was almost spot on as far as revenue. There was a slight decline because we had a mid-year tuition change. It resulted in an uh, almost a $14,000 loss in revenue, um, but expenses were less than budgeted by about $18,000. So we actually ended up with a surplus here um, compared to what we had projected of roughly 4,600. And going into FY21, we have uh, $226,909.61 in the special education revolving fund. Uh, the last fund we're gonna talk about for FY20 is the school lunch revolving. Uh, again, here was a decrease um, due to, there you go, perfect. Um, due to the closure, we were not receiving any revenue from students or families. We were receiving some government revenue, but very minimal. Uh, we were providing free breakfast and lunch, not just for students, but for family members of students if they needed it. Um, however, we did have wages and food costs that continued to be paid from the program. So we did make that transfer of uh, 13800 And with that transfer, we were able to end the year with a profit of $10,000 we started the year with a negative balance though. However, FY19 started with a deficit. So our end of year balance for school lunch at this point is just shy of $7,000 going into FY21. Any questions about FY20 revolving funds or otherwise before we move on to 21? Nope, okay. Uh, so, so far the analysis of the general fund, which I did send school committee the monthly budget reports just for the month of July, there's very minimal expenditures outside of salaries and wages and operating costs such as utilities or telephone, things like that. There's no major concerns at this point. I do expect that spending is going to be picked up in August as well as September. Um, as we get teachers back in the building and supplies need to be ordered, but right now, things are good status quo as they stand. Um, so looking at our school choice fund, uh, the expenses that are stated here of 327,000 include $40,000 for COVID related expenditures. We have not spent that $40,000 yet. However, I did wanna have money earmarked in the event we run out of grant funding and need other funding sources for COVID expenditures. 
We did also look at uh, the revenue to make sure that our targets were going to be met based on end of year enrollment for this year going into next year. Would we have any surprises? Um, Kristen, I think, anticipates we might have a few extra students compared to the end of year enrollment. However, we're not counting on those funds at this point. We want to stay conservative, go with what we know, what the cherry sheet showed. Um, but school choice does appear to be in good shape at this point which is great news because this is a revenue source where if we need to help offset some other funds, we have funds available here. Early childhood revolving. Um, so there's been some changes in the early, ch early childhood revolving program. The fund is starting out healthy with almost $95,000. Uh, however, revenue is significantly decreased from where we talked in uh, building the budget earlier this year. Um, this is because our enrollment is going to be reduced and the number of paying students because of special education students in the program taking um, the first priority for the spots that we have available, the limited spots that we have available, tuition is going to be very minimal this year. Um, we do have expenditures totaling around 65000 And as you can see here, regardless of the lower enrollment and the existing expenditures, we will have enough funds to cover all of our expenses this year. And if all goes well and we have no additional changes in revenue, then we'll have just over 51,000 remaining at the end of fiscal year 21. Um, this program I feel is sort of a moving target. And as the school year evolves, there could be revenue changes here that we need to be aware of. We may need to make considerations to move funding for salaries and wages to another account, such as school choice. Um, and I also think long term, we need to be thinking about how we're going to handle the expenditures related with this program. We don't know what FY21 enrollment is going to look like or what that revenue is going to look like. Um, but we do know that we're going to have salaries and wages for teachers regardless as we meet the needs of our special education population. So long term, we are going to have to think about this program in a different manner than we have in prior years and even this year. But right now, as it stands, still in decent shape. Just want to put it on your radar. Um, so special education revolving fund uh, remains healthy and in a good position based on what we know right now. Um, enrollment should be as we have projected and as we built this budget. Uh, we do have expenditures that exceed the budgeted tuition revenue. However, we do have a surplus, and at the end of the year, we are still looking at over $200,000 available in special <laughs> education. Sorry about that. Special education revolving funds. Um, so that's just a quick snapshot there. Darius, you can keep scrolling down. Not a whole lot to discuss with that at the moment. So school lunch revolving is definitely something that is on my mind, uh, like early childhood, a program that we need to watch. Um, while we do... Sorry. Somebody must have pulled in the driveway. Um, so currently the way that, as I explained, the way that it's been working and you all know is free lunches have been provided for all by, by what Desi put in place for the waiver. And that expires on August 31st. And we don't know if they're going to extend that. We don't know if the program is going to look different. Even if they don't extend it and families have to start paying for school lunch again, we have no idea how many kids are actually going to opt to have lunch provided by the school. So we do anticipate that revenue is going to be down. We have very little money in this revolving account to cover the expenditures, which right now um, just salaries and wages are almost $34,000. Uh, this does not count any food costs or overhead for the program. So we are going to have to have some conversations about how to pay for the salaries and wages at a minimum from other funding sources, such as school choice or general fund, if we can free up any general fund funds. Um, that sounds funny to say, but <laughs> uh, I, I don't have exact numbers for you at this point. I'm watching it really closely in conversation with Mary, the food service director, and working to come up with um, exact concrete numbers. I'm not sure how quickly we're gonna meet again. If it's in a week or two weeks, I probably won't have any more information likelihood that it, we need to get into late September, early October before we actually know what revenue is going to look like. 
but this is going to come back for us as a priority of things that we need to talk about. Um, so that wraps up the FY21 um, general fund and revolving accounts as they stand right now. I'm happy to take questions about that before we talk about um, the grant funding for Conway Grammar School. Nothing? You guys are easy tonight on me. <laughs> okay, so COVID grant funding. Uh, Conway right now has received $50,275 in COVID-related grant funds. Uh, we received $12,500 from the Municipal Cares Act in Conway. That was for the one-to-one -one technology, technology initiative. And then we have uh, another small amount of money coming in for PPE and sanitation materials. And then the Elementary and Secondary Education Emergency Relief Fund allowed for $20,000 in COVID relief funding for Conway. Um, right now, as it stands, I believe those funds are earmarked for professional development, technology, and COVID-related supplies and materials. But we can also use them for other expenditures that would be normally funded through Title I grants. So if something does come up that we don't have general funds available for it, and these relief funds are still available, we can use them, but we are trying to prioritize them for COVID-related needs, given we have so many COVID needs right now. Uh, the final grant that I wanna talk about is the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Conway has received $17,775 from DESE. This was a grant that was funded at $225 per foundation pupil. So this didn't count um, enrollment for any school choice children. It's just basically strictly off of Conway residents. Um, and it's not a large amount of money, but it's more money than we had planned on when we talked, to, when we talked in May. Um, we've spent just over half of that $50,000 already. And Kristen and I will be meeting to finalize some of the uh, rest of the budget for the grant funding sources. Additionally, what I don't have on here is that there may be other means from town municipal CARES Act funds that we can be in conversation with the town administrator about. We don't know yet what that would look like um, because the town also has their own COVID related expenses, but there could be some additional money captured there. Um, so that's the gist of grant funding at this point. And then we would tap into that uh, $40,000 that's in the, in the school choice account if needed. Any questions, comments, thoughts? I, I, yeah, just before Phil jumps on, have you ever had such a complete report in the last 10 years from a, a business manager, other than her dog scaring Jen Wheeler's dogs, which was very tra oh, right. traumatizing for them, I imagine? That was excellent. Now I'll ask your questions, Phil. Now, now Griller. No, I'm not. I, I, I would de definitely Im impressed with the breadth and scope of that financial report. Um, the, just, um, you know, we, we've been, we were anticipating such horrible numbers and to start, the, and to start the year in such bad, with such bad financial news. And this just seems to be across the board, um, better than the worst case scenario, which in and of itself sets it apart from everything else that's happened in 2020. Um, but the, and, and, you know, how certain, um, you know, how certain are we of this rosy, uh, of this relatively rosy scenario? And, I mean, we're, we're still on this, well, right? And, um, can the rug still get pulled from underneath us? Yeah, I'm sure Darius has some things that he could say about that. But from a financial perspective, you know, I feel like I touched on the accounts that we do have to be concerned about. Um, we have heard that Chapter 70 would be funded levelly, although I don't think we've received a formal notification about that, um, but that's what we've heard. So assuming that that's the case, then our general fund would be in really good shape. Um, the early childhood account and the school lunch are certainly areas of major concern where we could go from feeling okay to not at all okay really quickly. Um, because those are revenue based from sources that come directly from our families. So that's a hard one to pinpoint. Um, but I, you know, we are in a good position with school choice and, you know, $300,000 won't last very long. 
Um, but we are in a better spot than we did think we would be, you know, three months ago. Um, and there's still a lot of unknowns, like you're saying, absolutely. I think, Phil, I mean, I'm telling you stuff, as you already know, as a select board member, but, you know, basically <clears throat> next year is going to be a tough year, you know, with the revenues down across the state, um, people who are watching, you know, um, know, maybe you know, or maybe you don't know that, you know, basically our school budget was, was on the shoulders of the three quarters of the taxes that were already paid last year. So before COVID hit, so we only had to get through one fiscal quarter um, in order to support our budget. So next year, you know, we're going to have to go through an entire year that's going to be fiscally down. So I think it's going to be good that while we have revenues up, we need to be still be fiscally conservative um, and prepared so that any hit we take next for next year's budget, we can offset. Um, we can offset with our savings that we've made so far this year. Um, well, going into this year, that is. So we're not looking to be spending a lot of those. Um, a lot of those those excesses this year, those are going to be saved looking into next year unless we have emergencies. So at least that's the, the thought. I'll no, be back. No. <laughs> that, that seems that seems prudent. I, I am told that across our towns, the tax 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 receipts are a lot closer to last year than they thought they would be. And I know that's the forecast in this town as well. Yeah, and I guess when we talk about funding, and that's the one thing that, you know, schools Normally, you, you know, you get your different chapters from the state, and if the if the state helps the school out this year, you know, the schools with level funding 70, but they go after your 90 and your other chapters that, that go to the select boards and you guys get killed there, the, the bailout that you've done, not to say bailout, but the, the, the funds you've directed toward the school will not be as, will not be able to be as generous as they've been in other years. So we, it's, I, I'm, I'm watching it as a full picture because I know Political, it's a political year, you know what I mean? So people are going to be shifting things certain different ways um, to make it sound better, but there's only so much money to go to so many needs across the community. So and when you're in a place like Conway, that has a balanced need. We don't rely on Chapter 70 like the um, urban schools do more, more directly. You know, we rely on the local taxpayer. And we complain about it all the time until this year where we can rely on the local taxpayer. And that's, and that's going to be, we'll put us in a better shape. So, you know, Eyes wide open on here, and you're in as well. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, thank you, Shelley. Uh, that that was a fantastic report, and uh, we'll anticipate, you know, as we move into the school year, making the budgetary moves we need to to plug those gaps with salaries and stuff like that. So, um, all right. So after financial statement, the next uh, item is public comment. Um, I'll just say. Um, that uh, to get recognized for public comment, you'll want to put just your name in the chat. Um, the chat will just be a way where I can manage uh, calling on the next person. So I would just be, uh, thank you, Aja, for step uh, getting to be first there. That's excellent. So um, like I said, just put your name in the chat. I'll call on you. Our you know, typical uh, response is usually around three minutes. Um, and um, we, we seem to be doing pretty well on time, so uh, we'll open that up. Uh, Aja, you're, you're welcome to go first. Hi, I'm Aja Cerrone, and I co-chair the CPAC. We want to start by thanking the administrators and principals for adjusting the reopening plans to follow both the CPAC's recommendations and the guidance put out by DESE on special education. By listening to CPAC families and teachers about the need for a slower phase reopening, you are giving the most vulnerable students a chance to adjust to the new environment this fall before the rest of the students return. We deeply appreciate your change of course to include more students into the high needs category and not just the substantially separate IEP students that was initially presented at the Sunderland meeting last week. Having adaptive PPE available to special education students and staff, along with the option for a temporary shift to substantially separate classrooms, increases the safety of our neediest students. Providing the proposed technology options will improve special education students' ability to access content in both models. The CPAC values the assurances that the district will be able to quickly remedy the backlog of IEP evaluations in annual IEP meetings from last year, complete all upcoming annual meetings, and any amendment meetings that are requested this fall, in addition to providing IEP evaluations to students who are suspected of having new disability-related issues like anxiety or depression resulting from the pandemic. 
We are hopeful that all the information provided in the last three school committee meetings will be compiled into a special education fact sheet and readily available to families as quickly as possible. Because as all CPAC parents know, nothing is guaranteed until we see it in writing. Thank you for your ongoing collaboration. Thank you, Aja. Um, let's see in the chat here. So I currently don't see any other names for public comment. Michael, can I ask Asia a question? Asia, um, sure. would you would you feel comfortable um, emailing that to me so I can put that in the minutes, your statement? Yes, of course. Oh, thank you, Asia. You're welcome. All right, well, I will close public comments because I don't see any other names uh, put in the chat. Uh, so next item is new business, and we'll start with the uh, latest update on the state guidance for community data metrics for COVID safe schools. All right, uh, Conway own, Conway's own Meg Birch, our nurse leader, will we'll take the, the reins here and I'm gonna do another presentation. Um, if you run other meetings, Meg's getting better at this. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, no, that made it sound like we're doing well. Uh, you're doing great. You, she, you'll, you'll be hearing it again, is what I'm saying. Uh, it's important. Yeah, you know, I add some, I add some detail. I drop some detail probably each time. So, those who are truly paying close attention probably will notice differences. So. Um, I am starting um, presentations with this sort of just j this for me is a critical reminder for the components of health and safety for all of us with this, uh, with COVID. It really is wearing masks when we're outside of the home. Um, you know, even having one with you, if you think, you know, I mean, I walk my dogs at five in the morning, so, um, but I do have a mask with me and believe it or not, occasionally I do come across another person and put my mask on. Uh, physical distancing, six feet or greater, hand hygiene, staying home if you're unwell. So those are the things that are going to really help all of us out as we move forward. And I know you all know. So, um, in, you know, in trying to come up with reasonable data indicators um, that we could that we could use um, and that we could um, that the Board of Health could use in working with us to make determinations about what happens with schools. It was really important to me that we um, found we used data, we chose data that was accessible um, to anybody and so to make it as transparent as possible in terms of where were we getting numbers, how are we, um, what were we looking at to um, that to guide to guide decisions? So um, the data sources that we're currently relying on um, are the first two are from DPH, their weekly public health report, um, and um, their daily dashboard. The daily dashboard has um, well into what's what's on each. When I talk about the indicators, that might make it go quicker. Um, we are using the um, New York Times interactive map, um, which has case counts. Uh, you can get to case counts, but you can also look at county level data. And then the Harvard Global Health Institute um, has an interactive risk dashboard as well. And we can get, um, we can get data there, um, both at the county level um, that includes counts um, and, um, which factor into our um, indicators. So when the state came out last, yeah, go ahead. The state came out last week with their um, color-coded metric for schools and um, red, yellow, green, based on the average daily cases per 100,000. Those measures are 14-day rolling averages um, of cases. Um, and so, as you can see, greater than eight, they consider that red, four to eight yellow, less than four is green. Unstated on their, on their map um, is fewer than five total cases over the past 14 days. And that count, that's not an adjusted, um, a population adjusted um, statistic. So it, you kind of really can't compare the, the unshaded with the colored sections of the map other than, I mean, it's 
gives you some information, but they're not directly comparable. Um, I'd just like to point that out. Um, you can go to the next slide. So um, as part of their metric, they were making recommendations of what level of learning um, they thought was appropriate if your town was um, based on that metric. So anything over eight, they're saying that's fully remote. Their guidance was four to eight would be hybrid or remote if there were extenuating circumstances, which they don't define exactly, though they indicated in a follow-up call that those would be determined at the local level by the boards of health um, and the school district. Um, they're saying less than four cases per 100,000 would be, um, could be full in-person or hybrid. And then shaded if it's less than five, they're saying full in-person or hybrid. And again, with the extenuating, um, you know, I think we, we haven't really been talking about full in-person. So um, that's not really factored into our discussions in terms of what would happen at the So, um, in looking at the data and in thinking about, you know, how are we going to use these data? How are we going to make a decision? It seemed important to sort of basically get, basically rank them as what are our primary indicators? And so, um, you know, what, or what are different level indicators? So our primary ones are ones that basically say, this is a, we need to close. The situation is such that um, we're, we're going to be looking to uh, have a discussion with the Board of Health about, um, about closure. Those the primary indicators are based on statewide or regional data and very large numbers. So we, we would have confidence in the stability of the statistic. Um, the secondary indicators uh, would be things that would trigger a shorter term closure if those thresholds were crossed. Um, and uh, those would be local or regional indicators. And then Tertiary indicators are things that would really be a flag for us to um, have a conversation in-house, have a conversation with the local board of health and our public health nurse, Lisa White, to reassess what was happening at the local, regional, and statewide level. Um, and that would also include internal data. And then we'll go more into, I'll go more into what those indicators are. So the primary indicators are using that color, the metric, the DESI um, average daily cases um, per 100,000, um, staying under eight. Um, we're also looking at the seven day weighted average of positive tests, um, and that's available on the daily dashboard. Um, I looked yesterday, we were at 1.4%. I actually um, didn't have a chance to look um, this afternoon. Um, and that, yeah, um, I'm guessing it's going to be right around there. Um, and then we are still waiting for regional, um, for, for some kind of regional data from, um, from DPH. Um, they did update their, their map, which is available on the COVID dashboard. Um, and that is updated every, um, that's updated every Wednesday. Um, they did, they added a, a, an interactive piece to that, that if you hover over a town, it'll actually tell you some specific statistics about that town, but they have not yet done anything like allowed us to um, look at data at the county level or at the school district level. Um, and for us, our numbers are so small in our town, these, these population adjusted, you know, 100 rates, numbers per 100,000, those are, those are really for towns of like 50,000 or more. Um, Massachusetts does not report data um, for towns uh, that are under five counts for towns that are under 50,000 people. So it really, they're really, it hampers us. I'll stop there. <laughs> And we, we've been advocating, uh, I've been advocating and working with folks, you can go to the next one, Darius. I've been advocating and working with folks at FERCOG and in conversation with Joe Comerford's office and with others about um, trying to get the data from the state um, and, and really pushing them to give us regional and local aggregate data. Um, our secondary indicators, these are things we can calculate from the data that are available on those four places I, I described. So we can come up with 
cases in the previous 14 days for Franklin County, as long as that total case number for the 26 towns stays under 25, um, we're, you know, that then, then we would, uh, we would be in a good situation that would exclude things like an outbreak, um, or a small cluster at a skilled nursing facility or at the Franklin County jail, for instance, in a get setting. Um, I, I will, we're looking to calculate the percent positive rate for Franklin County using the DPH data. And we want that below 3%. And that is consistent with recommendations from the Global Health Institute um, out of Harvard um, for sort of a threshold in terms of what you're seeing in a community. Um, and then we're looking, and again, this is based on the uh, Global Health Institute data. We're looking at combined data for Franklin Hampshire counties of less than 10 cases per day or less than 70 per cases in a week. And those would have to be calculated to be um, you know, adjusted, so per 100,000 population. And we use the New York Times county-specific data from, from Massachusetts for that. And then the lastly, the tertiary indicators, and these are the other things that are just going to be kind of that we're gonna be looking at on a regular basis and would impact a decision um, to close or if closed to reopen. Um, and um, I really consider these flags that say we need to see what else is going on here. Um, so data trends, uh, increasing primary or secondary data is going to be a concern and, and will um, basically mean that we're all going to be looking at it a lot closer uh, to sort of get a sense of what's happening. If the data trends stay flat or are decreasing, then obviously that's less of a concern if, we're, um, if we are having uh, in-person learning data. We're going to be looking at the number of dismissals um, for the sort of similar symptom presentation or COVID-like symptoms and the absence uh, reports greater than 10% of who we expect to be in a building on a day. And the 1.9 just to sort of, it's kind of a, seems like a random number, but that's the baseline um, for the influenza-like illness for New England. Um, the 19 or 19, 2019, 2020 uh, flu season. Um, that's what that's what is used to sort of say, oh, there's more illness in a community than would be expected, or then you know there's there's an increase over what is sort of a that baseline number. Um, for our population, we're really talking a couple of kids or a kid and a staff person who are presenting as and way that that would be a flag and that we would be talking with the Board of Health and looking at all of our data points um, to really um, assess what was happening um, so that we could make an appropriate decision. Next. Yep, there it is. Okay, the last. So this is Seemed like in some of the other meetings there were there was some confusion around the closure and how long we would close and and um, so a, a, I consider a long term closure is greater than fourteen days and be when there is clearly widespread transmission in the community um, primary indicators are remaining above the threshold with no indication that they're going to level off or or decrease. A 14-day district or building-specific closure, um, and we would be looking at, um, you know, evidence of community spread, and we would also be looking at that there was a potential for in-school transmission, um, and that would be of, of great concern. We would want to be really looking at that, and that was something I talked extensively with our school physician about, um, that sort of monitoring for any evidence of an in-school transmission. And we would only reopen to say if we were to close in that situation, we would only reopen when the primary indicators um, were back below the threshold. And, and I would add that we were satisfied that there was no school, no transmission um, and no additional risk. Um, and then a short term enclosure is one to three or three to five days. And that's really to allow for a full assessment of data. That's when, you know, 
we find out we have a positive case or we have, um, you know, some people presenting with similar symptoms and we have decided we're not going to wait till we get to one of our thresholds, but we're going to do a short term closure so that we can get a full assessment of the data and we can figure out, um, you know, what, what may or may not be going on so that again, we can make an appropriate decision with it, really it's a board of health making the decision as to whether we would reopen or remain closed in a short term uh, closure. But that also could go to a long term closure. If the information that we found said, yeah, this is like something is is happening in our communities. And that could just be Conway, it could be the four towns, it could be that we're seeing evidence at the county level. Um, you know, our communities, as we all know, are so interconnected. Um, it's, you know, uh, and so our, we really need to be looking at our data um, from that, from that perspective. You are I realize that because of our uh, populations in our town are small, that being in the unshaded region, you know, we're not green or yellow or like it's, um, it would be good to have some kind of aggregate. So I appreciate your efforts on trying to get us an aggregate kind of um, count for that. Um, I, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around, are there roughly 100,000 people in Franklin County total? So like if- uh, No. 70,000. It's about 70,000. No. Um, right. So, yeah. So, so if there, if there's eight cases in all of Franklin County, then, then we are yellow. I like I, the whole, like on a, on a per capita basis, like the, you know what I mean? Cases in all of Franklin County, we would be red. Right, right. But that might uh, only be, you know, one person per town or something like that. It might be distributed quite, quite broadly geographically. Right. I mean, I don't know if, I mean, the, the map the other day, uh, last week they had updated the map last Wednesday. Um, and I believe it was Holyoke and Granby went from yellow to red on the map. And when I was looking at those data, um, Holyoke had 52 cases, um, and their um, rate per 100,000 was um, nine. Granby had seven cases, and their rate per 100,000 was 8.1. Um, so, right, so a small population, a couple of cases really shifts things. Yeah. yeah. And, and, that, and that's why, I mean, one of the things that one of the things, and we're not the only, you know, all of the districts are struggling with this. I was on a call today with public health nurses from um, other Franklin County towns from uh, including the Northampton public health nurse and then school nurse leaders from other districts. And, um, you know, part of what we were talking about was just, you, we can get some of the numbers and, and what, what I described for our metrics, we can get those numbers and I can calculate those. And I'm actually working, I'm in conversation with FERCOG to get them to calculate them <laughs> for a regular basis for all of us. Um, but even their data analyst said, you know, he can't get all of the numbers he needs to calculate the metrics that would be the most appropriate for us to use. So DPH publishes some of the raw data, but they don't publish all of it. Um, so it makes sense. Well, we, I mean, I would say that sister. we get kind of lost in where the different numbers are coming from. But I think the most important part on that is working with the local board of health. Because the local board of health gets gets the names of the individuals, and then they start the contact tracing. And so when we see an alarming, we see numbers going up, we're going to be immediately in contact with the board of health. Where are those cases? Are they in our school community or connected to our school community? Do we, have to, do we have to do a quick shutdown to do assessment because we don't have enough information and so forth. But we start talking about where numbers are coming from. It, I start to glaze over myself a little bit. I know. And I, we don't, yeah. where the rubber hits the road is right. us working in cooperation with the local board of health. And what do those numbers really mean? 
Right. Um, and and you know, did did you we have an uptake of five? And unfortunately, it's in a in a in a, in a facility somewhere. It was you know it's in a you know the prison. Well, that's not going to affect our schools unless it's in the, amongst their workers that are coming out of the prisons. You know, so those kind of things like we have to look at the data in depth. We the indicators are the canary. Um, you know that kind of thing, and then we move we move forward from there. So right. I just want to kind of clear that well, up. We start to go a, down. That's a helpful. You still uh, the other part. Now. You did say the other part. I just I didn't. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's and, a helpful you know, elaboration because um, that uh, that kind of showcases how like you, Meg, might might be working with the local board of health to really look more in depth at at what's happening in the community. Yeah. So I appreciate that. You were going to say something. Oh, just that, you know, part part of that also includes because the, the way that the data are reported is it, it it's reported to the town of residence of the individual when there's a case. Um, and so one of the things I have been working on and one of the purposes of the call today was on working on those communication channels. Um, and so I, you know, I have confidence that if um, you know, say like, right, I live in Greenfield. So if, if I were to be positive, um, I have confidence that the Greenfield Board of Health would be contacting the district. You know, when, when I report on my, you know, they're doing their investigation, I say, yeah, I, I, I work at Frontier some days and I work at Conway some days, they're gonna be doing their investigation and then they're, that's gonna be part of that follow up um, for, for, the, for the close contacts. And they'll be working with, Lisa White, who's the public health nurse for both Deerfield and Conway. So those, those avenues of communication are well established because this system is how we deal with um, 75 different contagious diseases on an ongoing basis before COVID. So all of these systems are in place and functional. Um, we're just interacting with them in a much more intimate way than we typically do. Um, unless, you know, we, we did a few years ago with the pertussis outbreak. Um, and, you know, so, so that's, those pieces are in place. It's just a little more complicated because of what we're dealing with. But the framework. Well, I appreciate all of your, I appreciate all your work and efforts on that. Uh, do any, of, I have one other question, but do any of the other school committee um, have any questions for Meg? Um, oh, Ashley, oh, I see Meg, how you joined. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, well, I joined and then I got kicked off and I rejoined on a different apparatus. Anyway, <laughs> um, I'm just wondering, Meg, in your experience, like, I, I've just heard a lot of horror stories about there not being enough tests or different time frames. So, like, a coworker of mine had to quarantine for two weeks. They said that there wasn't a test for him. And that if he was tested, it would come back in like 10 to 14 days. So it's not that I don't trust things, but I really don't trust things. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, so, I think. Like, does it matter? Like, is there a disparity? Like, is there, um, if somebody doesn't have as good health insurance, does that, like, what puts somebody ahead of the game for either being tested, getting results back quicker, or. Okay. Health insurance status has no impact. Um, so for our, our testing sites, um, really we have, we have Bay State Franklin, we have Cooley Dickinson Hospital, uh, we have the Community Health Center, um, which has testing in both Greenfield and Orange, and um, we have Valley Medical is, uh, they'll, be, they'll be doing testing starting in September. They have all of their equipment, they're still doing training. Um, and then there's additional, you know, their UMass Medical Center, if you, that's where you're a patient, they do tests. Um, and then there's, you know, CVS and some other test uh, sites that are doing testing. So what impacts the test return is where the, where the sample goes. So the CVS samples go to a national lab with all of the CVS samples from anywhere else that's sending stuff in. Um, Bay State Franklin, Cooley Dickinson, um, those are done in-house. And so those results, you know, where they're done within Massachusetts, they go to the state lab. So those results tend to come back 
Um, when I talked, I was on a call last week. Um, Bay State Franklin was 24 to 36 hours. Cooley was um, comparable. The community health center was 36 to 48. Um, they had been longer and um, their medical director was reporting that they had negotiated an agreement with Quest, who does their samples um, for community health centers of New England to get a faster return um, on test results. And they were successful in doing that. That's not to say that if a huge number of tests go in, there won't be a delay in a result. But um, the state is, has, is, and that was actually a topic um, on the call I was on today, and that inf Joe Comerford was actually on that call. Um, and we were really, we brought that back to her yet again about the need to really have assurance that test results come back um, within, a, within a timely fashion. But the other thing I want to just note is, and I think there's a lot of confusion about this, um, when somebody is quarantined, so if I'm in close contact with somebody who uh, is known to be a positive um, case, um, and I, I, am, I have no symptoms, um, I get a test, it's negative, I still have to stay in quarantine for 14 days. The negative test is not a pass out of quarantine. Um, and so, you know, there are times where um, sometimes somebody will say, well, why are you getting testing? Just do the quarantine. Um, and, you know, that decision is best made. You know, the, the recommendation from DPH is that anybody who is known to have close contact, so within six feet, for more than 10 to 15 minutes, you're considered a close contact. And then, and the recommendation is you get tested. Um, the sweet spot for that test is five to seven days from your exposure. So, um, you know, in terms of having a, 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 the greatest assurance that the test is gonna pick up um, positive if you're positive. Um, and, and, you know, the testing is, you know, is a question you know, I know, and I know people are concerned because we want to have that result. But the reality is, is it's a snapshot in time. If I get if I get swabbed today, and I get my result, and it's negative, but tomorrow I go over to a friend's house and have dinner, and they turn out to be positive or sick, you know my negative test result was a snapshot when the swab was taken. It's not necessarily going to mean that I don't, couldn't subsequently get it in the following days. So that's, I'm going way into the weeds. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll stop. <laughs> but does that answer? Some Ashley? of that. Uh... Sorry. Yeah, that, that answers my question. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I said to somebody earlier today, um, and I didn't get a chance to say to, to Darius or to principals, you know, I think one of the things I need to really prioritize is putting together some kind of presentation and, you know, meeting for, um, you know, for each, each school community to, to just go over this kind of information because um, it's not information that we all you know, eat and drink and sleep um, on a daily basis. Um, public health nurses and the role that I'm in, we are, but it, most of us aren't. And I think I think that um, I would be more than happy to try to go through some some sort of basic information that I think would answer a lot of of questions and concerns and. Um, just provide sort of a you know the framework of what is existing in terms of the public health response for something like this. Matt, that would be great if you did that. We could also invite uh, the school committee and just the community. Uh, that'd be great. Thank you for that. Yep. And uh, like I said, I have one question, but Denise or Philip, do you have any questions for Meg? No. No. Hi, Denise. Hey, Phil. <laughs> um, so my question, it might be for you, Meg, or, or for Darius. Um, in the event of numbers rising in the community, is it a, a complete Union 38 closure? Is it uh, specific to 
a specific school? Like, will some schools stay open and others go through a closure? Or, or I guess it's, I guess the numbers are different between like uh, Franklin County numbers going up dramatically might trigger one type of closure and something happening in the school might be a different. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a case by case. You know, I think certainly if there's indication that there's, you know, within our within our region, and I when I think region, I think Pioneer Valley because I know we don't all live in Conway or in Franklin County even. Um, you know, I think that would be something that we would be talking with all four boards of health about. Um, and, you know, and, and part of that is to see what other information they have, because they'll have information on residences that are resident people who are residents who we won't have that information if, if it's not been reported to us at the school. So they'll be able to say, you know, really the only case going on right now is you have that one case. Um, it's a healthcare worker or it's somebody who just came back from, I'm going to throw Florida under the bus. Um, and, you know, they came back, they've been in quarantine since they came back and, but they had a positive test. Right. Um, and they've had no contact with the school. Right. We, we've done our investigation. There's absolutely no, nothing we can find that indicates contact with, with any, anybody in the school community, then the school could stay open. Right. Or even say it would say it was a family, you know, came back and there or a household came back and they didn't have kids in the school. Right. Um, or even if they had school age kids, but those kids had been remote and nobody had left the house. Again, if there's no contact. There's no close contact with anybody in our community and they're maintaining quarantine and, or isolation if they're symptomatic. Then we 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 could reasonably and safely continue if the information we're getting is, well, there's this case and then there's this other case and we, there's this connection, but, oh, now these, there's other connections. We're not sure what's happening there. That level of uncertainty is the kind of thing where I say that that would be a, a conversation with the local boards of health where I would expect them to say, close down, close down so we can figure out what's going on here, you know, for a short term closure. You know, it's that that's the sort of level of assessing the situation. Um, if we don't have enough information and and there's a concern, you know, we can't say with certainty that there hasn't been close, haven't been close contacts. That needs to be looked at. It's you know, it's not. Well, thank you. It's complicated. Yeah. I can't just say yeah. if this, then that. You know, and and it really well, is a conversation with our local board of health and our public health nurse. So, well, well, thank you for all you do in that regard. So we, we certainly appreciate it. You are welcome. Um, yeah. So next on the agenda, we have uh, planning and scheduling for hybrid and remote models. Yeah, right. so I mean, I kind of dropped the, uh, the information at a school committee meeting last night. This is the difficulty when we break apart to our individual stuff when I'm doing stuff across all district information gets staggered. So I apologize for that. Um, and then also the community members who are hearing about it in piecemeal. Um, basically I, I kind of rolled out, um, I don't say rolled out of bed, but that's not true. Uh, I, I rolled out of, um, to our first meeting on and, and Monday morning with the administrators. And we really thought long and hard that we really needed to slow down even more the process to roll out because um, there's so many moving parts um, that, that, that's affecting us um, that we wanted to start with a two-week remote. And some of the factors of that decision, which I'm bringing before you, um, you know, basically is the first one was that, you know, I was contacted by the local board of health regarding the concern about that Thursday, Friday coming out of the Labor Day weekend, that that's going to be prime incubation period to then show up in our, in our community um, and that we had numbers after the 4th of July. And if we have any kind of end of Summer kind of thing. The time was impressive. So they're wondering if we could push it a couple of days. So I started with that. And then, um, <clears throat> you know, we're currently negotiating with teachers and trying to prevent, provide accommodations for those teachers that need them. And that's also asking us to kind of, you know, look at how we're doing the classroom um, teaching and creating teams and modifying that. That's going to need a little bit more time to be, to be ironed out. 
There's also this endless, you know, we're you know getting facilities up the up to speed. They got HVAC going through. HVAC has gone through all the buildings, but they also have to repair some issues in some of the buildings. So I need a little bit more time there. So as they kind of added up all these things, if everything was going to get on time, it could possibly happen. Um, but now I magnify it by five separate schools, five separate, you know, you know, you know, stabs and that kind of stuff. Um, I really I felt like I needed more time there. And so um, it is. I have to own that. I, I think I went to the buffet with, with 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 bigger eyes and put more on my plate than I thought, you know. And also, I mean, I'll blame the state. I mean, the, the, the timeline they gave us to, we should have had the decision of how we we're going to go forward, not the first week of August where they asked us to make the decision. Had we known the first week of July, we'd been in a better spot. Um, but I also understand, I understand the perspective. But anyway, that's how I got here. So I'm, I'm going to present to you um, what we presented last night. I'm going to ask Kim uh, McCarthy to jump on to kind of walk us through it since she is um, just the. Um, oh, I, I'm going to share my screen before I present my screen. Um, do, 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 zoom. And I'm going to make that one 25. Thanks. All right, so Kim, just kind of walk us through, um, you know, rather quickly um, where we're at there, and then you guys can ask some questions. That's great. Hello, everybody. Um, it's ha I'm happy to walk through this with you. Those light pink days, they're the 10 days that the teachers have for PDs, and the PD schedule is being developed. So um, those are written there, and I'm sure that teachers have questions, and we will be supporting the teachers with the PD in different models. Then the actual first day of school is September 10th, and where we start to do our remote orientations there. And as Darius spoke of, you know, we're slowing it down a little bit and um, thinking of, we before we were saying they were going to be remote and in-person, and there's that Labor Day holiday just before, so we're trying to be extra safe and do those orientations through remote channels. Then when we move down a little bit to the week of September 14th, that's the week where we really can see the slowdown model. Those days are really now remote days. Before they were cohort days where we, they would come in every um, every other day. So that's that's where we've slowed down. And in addition to that, we've added some special education programming to start really meeting the needs of our most vulnerable learners. On Wednesdays, all Wednesdays, we're, there'll be a remote day for all students in our um, union schools. And that allows us to meet their needs remotely in the morning and also provide professional development for the teachers in the afternoon. And our professional development needs are, are wide and deep. So there's a lot to do in those afternoons. When you look at the 26, those orange colors, Blocks, those are to increase our vulnerable uh, populations coming into the building and programming for them. All others will maintain remote on those days. And um, depending on which schools, there's possibility of small social emotional connections um, scheduled at the schools outside for folks. Then when you see that kind of peachy color on the 24th, 25th, 28th, and 29th, that's when we're starting our AB cohorts, like what we originally rolled out to you a bit ago. So that's the dismissal is at noon. Um, there are half days, and there will be remote activities to extend the learning in the afternoon. We slow down this just a little bit to have options. So half the cohort A can come on one day, then the other half of cohort A would come on the following day that they're scheduled. So in other words, A is coming on the 24th, the half, and another half on the 28th. And that will really allow us just a slow, very interpersonal way to meet with the children and to do our responsive classroom, to ask and answer questions, to figure out where students are in their thinking and their learning. So when you get to those, um, those blue days, those are our typical cohort A, cohort B half days, right? And then eventually we will move to, to full days as we go on. 
I think um, the caution is I want to say to everyone, it's not the calendar that opens the gate to the next phase. It's really all these health metrics that, that Meg and Darius and Kristen have been talking to you about. So those are possibilities. And again, flexibility is always needed and, and being able to pivot. Darius, I think that pretty much covers those days. Thank you, Kim. Ms. McCarthy. Questions on, uh, on that, that change there? Yeah, and I don't have like a grid view, so um, I'll just maybe, Ashley, do you have a question? No. Uh, Denise? No, I don't think so. I know we're meeting tomorrow with Chris and his parents too, so that'll be good. Right. You know, just to jump in on, because you mean talk about Kristen, who's amazing. Um, I just got to say that she's just really, you're, you're, you know, she's really pulling the, the community forward. There's a lot of challenges that Conway has, um, and she's really trying to, um, you know, create something special up there. Um, and I also understand, you know, talking with a, you know, uh, hearing from a Conway parent today, you know, Conway is probably in a different zone. I know Kristen's going to probably be doing more a little bit, probably a little bit quicker up in Conway, um, getting the staff on board first before moving quicker. Um, but, you know, I'm looking at the district wide and we're talking about schools that are much larger um, and that kind of thing. So, you know, Kristen will talk about tomorrow how, you know, how she envisions if they're going to do the idea of, you know, social emotional groups happening earlier, that kind of thing. It really in the left become building based. You know, we have to kind of roll out together as one group, um, but also, you know, but each building can kind of um, take off on some of those other offerings as they come up. And, um, I think as Kristen's going to talk probably more about that more tomorrow night, right, Kristen? I uh, don't expect you to go into detail tonight, but I'm talking about the right tree, right? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so, some, some big changes I see are um, instead of the orientation being in person, the orientation will be remote on the 9th and 10th. And um, potentially... Uh, a student might not have their first half day in person meeting until September 29th if they're, say, cohort B, the other half of co cohort B. That might be their first time conducting an in person visit. Um, so that's that is a that is a change. Um, and I can imagine for families that'll probably, uh, you know, necessitate some trying to figure out childcare and some other things like that, because it is a, it is a change. Um, but Darius, I do understand that um, you've really been working with the administration to get all of these incredibly complicated moving pieces together. You know, the, the in-building supports and the staffing and all of these things. So uh, I appreciate all that you're doing to pull this off. Yeah, and, and you know, I know that you know the parents and such. And I know my, I could say my sympathies out to you. I mean, I'm a parent as well, with you know, with two guys in the uh, in the district as well. Um, and we just can't, um, you know, we just we're we're trying. Well, we're trying to support parents as much as we can. I know Kristen's reached out and had probably conversations with almost every family already. Um, if you haven't been contacted by her. She'll let her know because she's trying to get a hold of almost every family to talk about how we can be supportive. Even though, because I know we are that that care um, facilities so that parents can also work um, and, and so forth. And if we had a better plan, I'd, I'd have a better plan, um, you know, but this is where we're at right now. Yeah, so Michael, through the surveys that people filled out when they checked off um, child care is a hardship or they're not sure, um, I'm following up with all of those families. You know, kids that I consider vulnerable students are not only students who, um, have some who have students have special needs. I consider um, some t some students who are only children, students with working parents, students who don't have internet access. So I have my lists going um, and considering all of those students under the vulnerable learning category. Um, and although our teachers will be doing some PD and remote and all of that, I do have ongoing thoughts about how to help those those kiddos and those families. Thank you so much. Um, and so encourage people to tune in tomorrow to the uh, parent meeting that the sorry the hybrid opening 
meeting that you're going to hold tomorrow night. That's at 630. I think. Um, I, I'm gonna, I was going to do the um, parents who chose remote, which are very, very few, uh, at 530 mm. because they have very different okay. questions than the parents who chose hybrid at 630. I think I think we're okay. at 84 percent that have chosen hybrid at this time. Okay. And um, just looking at the agenda, Kristen, are there any reports tonight that you're making? Um, you know, Michael, I can give a quick, real quick update on some numbers for just so that the committee has. Um, so uh, we are at this time, um, which is a little different from what I had given you earlier in the week. Um, we're at 84% of our students choosing remote. Um, we, we've, I'm sorry, really what was that again? I mean, hybrid, sorry. Okay. <laughs> hybrid. <laughs> really right. thrilled that we've been working with the staff to develop teaching teams. Uh, I think this is one of the most important things I want to stress to the school committee in particular, because I know you've gotten a lot of questions about this. Um, so we've been working together as a staff to develop teaching teams and, and the, te the faculty has been really amazing. So that um, as Darius looks at, looks at the change of placement um, uh, uh, requests and things like that, We've created teams so that if a teacher is indeed going to teach remotely, he or she can still teach their whole class with having another teacher in school helping with the hybrid model. So, you know, I had this one parent, for example, who called me and she was very, she was crying. She's like, you know, I have to choose remote for these reasons. But my, my child really needs Mrs. Decision this year. And there are many phone calls like that, many. And so I really sat down and said, okay, we really need to make this work and met with Kim and Darius. So I, I'm really happy to say that we will keep our Conway kids and our Conway kids will have have the staff that they they know and love, just like any school, the staff they know and love. So so I'm really happy to do that. And again, I'm I'm I have my lists of people who need who have, you know, need childcare. We I'm starting to plan for that. Um Special education, I've talked to parents, uh, you know, individually in terms of needs. And the last thing I want to mention is um, we have a, we have 15 students right now that need transportation. And I'll be working with Darius and Shelly on that also. So just some quick numbers for people. Thank you. And it sounds like you'll be able to address more specific concerns at your meetings tomorrow. So I, I appreciate Yeah, I've that. been over the past, like, uh, maybe seven days. I've given parents my phone number. I, I've probably gotten about 32 calls, and it's nice to talk to people individually with with their concerns, but then we'll have a group meeting tomorrow. But, yeah, I, I like when people call me and they can say, okay, I'm worried about this, and we, we can work through it, staff and parents. So that's been good. Excellent. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Phil. So um, not to not to change the subject, but to change the subject, just um, I, I do. The one thing besides the COVID stuff that I get asked the most about school is about playground construction and when we can expect it to start and um, if there is a playground update. Oh, that's a great question. Yes. Yeah. So um, um, we're, we're going we're going to go out to bid. Obviously, we have the one, but we need a firmer bid on that. And I'm expecting. I'm expecting that to start the first week of September. We've got some companies lined up and ready to do those bids. And then I'm going to come to talk to you about the rest of the money. Oops, great. Say Thanks, Phil. <laughs> but, it, but it looks like it's going to be happening in the fall. Yeah, we'll start the process, yes. I also want to just mention to the school committee, we have um, – we have a, a parent who's leading a huge charge in fundraising for a lot of the things that we need. And she just set a goal with me today at, tw at 20,000 and she's got um, Carrie LeSignan and she's got a group going and she's going to be speaking at our parent meeting and really trying to hope to raise money for some of the things that we need COVID related. And also we can talk about playground needs as well. Great. So we're on it. Good. Excellent. Um, so our next item on the agenda is uh, the CPAC concerns or any questions that we have regarding special education, meeting the needs of special education students as we uh, 
move into our opening plan. So, um, and I know that, yeah, yeah. go ahead, Darius. Yeah, I was just say Karen's here to um, just kind of give a brief overview of where, how would our approach is this fall and what she's doing with in special education. Unmute. Boy, I just said a lot. You missed it all because I, I, I was <laughs> oh, muted. No. So I was saying that I was going to talk about what we're all doing uh, in special education because as you heard from Kristen, uh, she's doing a lot and reaching out to all the families and that Conway is so on it. So just district wide, I want to acknowledge that this is on the agenda due to uh, a letter that was sent to school committee uh, from the CPAC. Uh, with current concerns regarding uh, reopening. And as you can hear from Asia, uh, it's kind of funny, I think we're kind of communicating through uh, various school committee meetings uh, and, and just kind of getting updates. Um, but as this letter came out, there were concerns as far as the plan for special education. Um, and some of the things that I said uh, earlier in Sunderland last week are some of the things that I just want to remind everybody is when we do talk about special education, we're talking about special education who are also general education students and special education is a supplemental service. So a lot of our special education students, when we think of them are attached to our um, a hybrid model uh, that is now voted on um, and is rolling out. And specifically what happens from there, as Kristen was saying, as we reach out to families, we, we know from our teachers, from the experiences in the spring, uh, from feedback and also from our IEPs, who our high need students are. Um, and some of the confusion, if I may just address that is um, in Sunderland, what I had said is a lot of the school districts locally and around us are really limiting their high needs um, or more complex needs students based upon the DESI, the guidance by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education for those to be prioritized for in increased in-person instruction. And what I was saying is we have such an inclusive community that our high need students don't have what we call a substantially separate placement. Uh, we actually don't have them out of the general ed population for the most part, 60% of the time. So we won't necessarily be using that um, as a guide. We'll have a broader guide. Um, and in Sunderland, what I was saying is we have a number of students that we recognize and we call them by CAS or different things that we can be guaranteed that those students will receive in-person instruction. Uh, so we do have a broader lens, as Kristen said, she's reaching out, her faculty is reaching out, everybody's reaching out to parents, getting their input. We know who our students are, but we know needs have changed. Uh, and kids and families have experienced uh, new anxieties, new stressors, and we know those needs are changing. So we're reaching out to families. Uh, and then we have increased in-person instruction for our students that are seen as high priority. Uh, or high need. And then what we do for all our students is with that input from parents, we will be broadcasting back out uh, with the documentation of how and when those IEP services will be delivered. So you have your general ed services, you have your model of delivery, and then we have our teachers and our faculty and our related service providers meeting with our general ed teachers and principals to define how the, the IEP services will be implemented. And those will go out in a document to families and say, hey, during the school day, this is when the IEP services will occur. Uh, and so that will be happening. We're meeting with the Special Education Strategic Planning Committee tomorrow to start to discuss what that document will look like that will be sent out to families uh, to document the IEP services. Um, so I just wanted to note that um, as far as the plan for special education, and I do want to thank the CPAC attached to that, uh, their concerns as far as the plan for special education was a, a list of accommodations or things that could be considered for our high need students. Um, many of those that are, are have been thought of and many of those are a wonderful uh, reflection and insight from our parents and they will be taken to our faculty and be shared as far as things that we can consider when we're looking at accommodations and modifications for our students with IEPs. One note of distinction that we should make is when we're 
sending out documentation of how and when the IEP services will be done. Those are for the how and when for the implementation of our IEPs. They do not warrant an IEP meeting. So they can be done uh, through communication with parents, um, dialogue with teachers, and then you send out that documentation because it's how and when the services might look a little different in the hybrid model. If we determine that a need of a child has changed, if their goals have changed, if the vision has changed, if their needs have changed, then that will warrant an IEP meeting. So that, that communication with the parents will trigger whether or not it's a documentation that goes out of how the services are implemented. Uh, but there will be instances when the significant needs of a child have changed and we'll have to look at a change in that IEP. And that's where we'll have an IEP meeting. Um, and I did at the last meeting, I'll be very clear, and it was in the FAQ that went out uh, to parents um, under special needs considerations that the district is prepared to hold most of our meetings remotely, but to do those in a timely manner, um, and also to work with our related service providers and our faculty uh, to be able to do uh, evaluations for our students that we might need to determine uh, eligible as because of new concerns. Um, or for our students that are up for evaluations. Uh, we'll be making professional judgment based on uh, professional judgment and students' needs uh, to what extent those evaluations can be held remotely or what parts will be need to done it, be done in person. And I'm looking forward to all faculty returning um, and having their insights and really being able to plan that out with principals and faculty. That was a lot of talking. If you have specific questions, um, anybody, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, so thank you. Well, thank you, Karen. Um, that's good information to have out there. Um, and I just want to thank your work. Uh, yeah, and if you, it looks like you have another additional. Go ahead. Oh, I just want to, to acknowledge that I heard loud and clear uh, to uh, many of the things that have been discussed in these school committee meetings uh, to put them together into an FAQ um, and, and I'll attach that to the information that went out into the addition, the original FAQ number 20 in the, and I will send that out to all parents with IEP. So I heard that Asia, it's acknowledged. Um, and I did ask Kristen to forward me your letter once she gets it and we'll pull out of that and I'll, I'll put it all back out to you in writing. So uh, thank you for asking for that um, and I'll get that out to you. Would awesome. It, yeah, would so it maybe gonna, be, was, yeah, go ahead. Would it maybe be a good idea to just reach out ahead, to, okay. every, to everybody with an IEP and just say, hey, do you think your child's needs have changed since March because they have been out of school for so long? Just so that if, in fact, you know, in 2023, when we are back in school, we, uh, you know, we're ahead of the game in terms of. I hear you, Ashley. So, so, Ash, um, if it, you know, if it's if people don't mind me grabbing this question, I don't uh, mind at all. Okay, thanks. Um, so I've been reaching out to parents, um, of students on IEPs or um students who um fall into what I what I um noted as a vulnerable student category, um, in terms of what we think they need in terms of days right now and schedules and um, talking about if we wrote remote learning worked, didn't work. Um, and so we're setting that up now. And then the next part will be the conversations around the services and okay, it looks like this child has 60 minutes of reading services what if they had one hour of, I mean, um, you know, 45 minutes of in-person service versus 60 minutes of remote service. So I started with trying to map out the needs in terms of the days and whether remote was successful for each student or not, and whether parents were looking for it in person or not and all of that. So I've sort of have that mapped out. And then the next phase will be taking a look at IEP grids and the, the needs and the profiles and things like that. So yeah, well, the way I've been doing it is by just contacting each family. I think it's more personable and I just get a lot more information. Does that sound good, Ash? Yeah, yeah, yep. 
And just for, I know there's other people from other districts out there um, and, and just listening. And I, I just want to clarify that step one for everyone. I know uh, Kristen's been doing it and I know other principals have been reaching out and I know I'm in communication with many parents um, and families. And I know our faculty, even though they're not back yet, are uh, constantly uh, communicating with families in different ways. But hey, Ashley, the step one for all the schools uh, is to be reaching out to parents. Um, so every parent on an IEP will be contacted by the, either their liaison or their principal throughout the district uh, and to make a determination for next steps and then, then be given uh, a documentation on how the IEP will be implemented, just to clarify that. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, that was a great question, Ashley, and I love that our district is uh, has an invitational approach. They're reaching out and inviting yeah. the conversation, so... I appreciate, I appreciate everybody's effort on that. And I wanted to say uh, thank you, Karen, for all that good information. And I wanted to thank uh, Aja with, with her public comment um, that she presented during the, um, from the CPAC uh, at the beginning of the public comment. So thank you, Aja, for that. And just all the work that all of you are do, doing to uh, coordinate the support for uh, the students in our school. So I appreciate that. Um, so if there's no other questions from school committee members for any of the admin team that we have here, um, I think we've made it. Just check here the end of the agenda. Um, And so our next thing would be if we have uh, a need to go to executive session. And um, in order to do that, I think we'd have to say that we're gonna be uh, ending this meeting here and we do a roll call to exit, to go into executive meeting with the understanding that we would not be coming back to this uh, public meeting afterward. I get that straight, Darius? Great, perfect. All right, so. Um, Motion to adjourn. I'll, do, <laughs> Phil, do you feel like there's a need to go to, to executive session to, uh, I can read the full statement here. Um, pursuant to MGL chapter 30A section 21A3 to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining uh, teachers and instructional assistants. Does anybody want to make a motion for that? So move. Phil is on it. Is there a second? Yeah, second. Thank you, Asha. Um, so uh, we'll do a roll call to approve that we'll uh, go to executive session with the understanding that uh, We'll adjourn from there and not return back to the public meeting. Uh, so, uh, Ashley. Yep. Yes. Philip. Yes. Denise. Sorry, Denise. Yes. Ah, thank you. And Michael, yes. So, uh, Darius, we'll meet you on the. Executive meeting.